I am incredibly cheap. And so when I saw that I could get a MetaQuest 3 that has a little bit of damage to the front facing sensors, but still a functional display and optic system, I went for it and it's time to tear this down and take a look at some of the amazing engineering that's now two years old. We're actually taking a look at a VR headset finally. It's been quite a bit of uh, time that we spent mostly on glasses so far, especially like the Meta Ray Band displays that just came out. But I think it's topical now that Samsung has announced a new entrant into the field of uh, very high end premium XR devices like the Galaxy XR to take a look at some of the early days uh, and see if we're really improving on some of these optical designs. These meta uh, displays have been around for about two years now, uh, originally launching in October of 2023. MetaQuest 3 was essentially the first introduction of a pass-through device that was incredibly affordable, $500 uh, average selling price. And at that price point, what you got was a very high-end LCD device. The uh, displays in here are two high-resolution LCD displays, a 2200 by 2064 pixel per eye LCD display, compared to around 3500 uh, by 3800 for the Galaxy XR. This obviously means that the pixel pitch for this Quest is going to be significantly higher, around 21 microns uh, from pixel to pixel versus the six and a half microns for the Galaxy XR and a similar order of magnitude for the Apple Vision Pro. And this is where we start getting one of the major differences between these devices. This device right here, you can very clearly see what is known as the screen door effect. Virtually, you are looking at the individual boundaries between pixels when you actually put the headset on and you're looking at a specific location in the headset. Now, that translates to a uh, pixel density of 25 pixels per degree, 25 PPD, versus the much higher 35 to 40 PPD that we get for the Apple Vision Pro and the Galaxy XR. But what you get in higher resolution display, you also lose in refresh rate. And this is where Meta seems to win out even with a much, much lower price device. These devices are capable of running up to 120 hertz, 120 times screen refreshed per second. This doesn't sound like a big difference versus the up to 90 that Samsung just announced, but this is a major contributor to comfort in virtual reality. This means that you'll be much more likely to have a more comfortable experience with a high refresh rate display, regardless that the resolution is slightly lower than what you might see with a micro OLED display. Thankfully, Apple with their Apple Vision Pro 2 has just released a new 120 hertz mode for that particular display. It's going to consume quite a bit of battery, but the likelihood that you will have motion sickness in VR is going to be drastically reduced. Now that's the display. The lens system is the other aspect of uh, what makes this particular device so interesting. Inside this device, we have two pancake lenses. They're known as pancake lenses because we're literally sandwiching some optical functionality in between various lens elements. And we'll dig into that and what this really means. But this was the first time that somebody had put in a pancake lens design into a consumer headset less than $1,000. It was very, very impressive at the time for Meta. And now all of our high-end devices, which realistically is the only uh, segment that people are still targeting for VR, use this type of technology, a pancake lens design. This allows us to fold the optical path and increase the focal distance between your eye and the display panel, meaning that they can put the panel much closer to your eye than they would be able to in something like a Fresnel lens design and shrink the overall thickness of your headset, making this much more comfortable to wear, especially for long periods of time. And really impressive to see that even though there are some significant differences about the pancake design in this particular lens optic, ultimately we get a very, very similar field of view to what we're seeing out of the Galaxy XR and the Apple Vision Pro devices at around 109 110 degrees uh, horizontal by 100 degrees vertical. 
Another really important part of comfort is obviously not just the display resolution and display refresh rate, but the overall heat that's generated by having and strapping two very, very uh, fast running displays straight to your head. Overall, the Quest 3 is really impressive with only the faceplate itself getting up to roughly around 40 Celsius. Wouldn't be comfortable for extended wear if that was in direct contact with the skin. That's uh, really the only part of the device that gets as hot as it does. On the inside here, we take a look with our thermal camera and we can see that we stay within 32 degrees Celsius or lower, meaning that you will generally not have any issues with the temperature of the device facing your face. So we'll tear into the MetaQuest 3 and look at the display panel and the pancake lens itself to understand how these work and see if we can learn anything about how upcoming designs like the Galaxy XR, once it ships, will actually function as well. Just remove all of these clips around the perimeter. Depending on how dirty your face is, you may also have some sticking happening around the lens elements like we see here. And then we just take off this plastic faceplate, leaving behind our main headset, lenses, and the rest of the device. We can also remove a little plastic shroud that we have on each of our lens and display assemblies that helps prevent any light leakage from the very lossy optical elements into the rest of the system, preventing further any unwanted ghosts that may reach the user's eye during operation. This allows us to take the plastic housing that holds our element in place mounted to the display underneath. Once we're ready to access the display panels and disconnect them from the board, we simply pop off the connector on either side of the main central logic board and are able to snake it out individually, removing the actual display panel and optics, which allows us to take our front facing cameras connected to the unit and plug back in our display module. Fortunately, we have a very operational LCD panel mounted to the optical assembly of our Meta Quest 3. Our Meta Quest 3 optical module is a decently bulky element, weighing in at almost 40 grams per each module. That means that just the display and lens alone are going to make up more than 30% of the overall weight of the system. If we turn the optical module on its back, we can see that we have a bracket that connects the lens housing to the actual display panel, keeping them mated and making sure that we don't have any slip between these two components. We're gonna to have to take this bracket off before we can get further access to the display panel underneath. Once we remove the plastic housing from the display panel, we are left with the LCD panel that comprises our main display. On the very top of our display, we have the color filter. The next layer that we have is the transistor layer. The transistor or thin film transistor, TFT layer, is actually the main driving circuitry for our LCD panel. The main light actually comes from our backlight unit, our BLU, which is on the far right. This is an array of light emitting diodes, which injects light into our light guide plate, this textured piece of plastic, which helps take the light from a horizontal injection into a piece of plastic and redirects it vertically into our liquid crystal panel. This backlight unit is meant to provide all of the light for any of the individual pixels that we're going to turn on or off, whether red, green, or blue. And then eventually that light will pass 
through our liquid crystal panel that we've broken into two parts. On the bottom, our transistor layer, which helps drive the actual liquid crystal module to either allow light through or to block light from passing through the next layer the front plane and color filter, which helps separate the individual light that's been allowed by the individual pixels into either red, green, or blue channels delivered directly to the eye. After the backlight unit, we have our bottom portion of the liquid crystal panel, which includes all of our transistors that individually switch on or off the liquid crystal layer and allow light from the light guide plate to actually shine through the display or ultimately get absorbed within the individual layers of the liquid crystal, appearing as black to the user. We can see that the, this bottom layer is polarized by taking a linear polarized film and putting it in front of our display. When the axes of the polarizer and the polarizing film on the liquid crystal are 90 degrees to each other, we see no light pass through. But as we rotate this 90 degrees, we can see that light going through the bottom of our liquid crystal is linearly polarized to then ultimately send light to the front of our display. The front of our display, similarly, will have a linear polarizer that will either completely block light in one direction or com the front of our display will also have a linear polarizer that will similarly either block light completely in one direction or allow all the light to pass through this layer at 90 degrees. This particular portion of our local crystal display also has the color filter, which takes individual pixels from our transistor layer and splits them into either red, green, or blue, ultimately making up a full color pixel to deliver three color channels to our eyes. What is unique about this type of lens element is that we actually have a very complicated optical path through this lens. We can actually see this by shining a green laser through our optical module. If we shine straight up, we will see roughly a single beam of light. But as we make the laser take a further and further oblique angle, we see that inside what's happening is that the rays are continuing to bounce off of the individual optical elements within our display. This lens consists of the user-facing lens, which has two optical films on it, a reflective polarizer and a quarter wave plate, and then the display facing element, which is primarily using a half mirror to bounce the polarization back within our folded optic. We can see that these lenses are plano convex, meaning that both lenses have two flat surfaces facing each other that have been separated by an air gap within our lens element, and then convex portions on either side facing either the display on the right or the user on the left. The user facing lens has two optical films laminated to it, which we can remove with a little bit of alcohol to see exactly what optical film functionality we have here. This is what's known as a reflective polarizer, a polarizer that in one direction will reflect all polarized light, but in another direction will let it pass. We can see the functionality here by taking our linear polarizer again and putting it on top of our reflective polarizer. We can see that in this direction, the axes of transmission for the reflective polarizer and transmission for the linear polarizer are aligned, meaning that the same amount of light will go through just one polarizer or both. But as we rotate this 90 degrees, we now see that we have zero transmission. And in fact, there is some reflection 
back from the camera that's going to get reflected once the light passes through this linear polarizer. On the opposite side, we have a quarter wave plate laminated to the back of our reflective polarizer. We can see this because a small region of our quarter wave plate has actually been cut off during the removal of the reflective polarizer. When we take a linear polarizer and we take light that's gone through our reflective polarizer and the quarter wave plate, we will never fully block the light coming out of this polarizing element because we are rotating the polarization of the light coming through here. And you can see in the small cutout above that it only has a reflective polarizer that we do in fact block all of the light, meaning there is a quarter wave plate element laminated to this side of our reflective polarizer. So to recap, our entire optical module consists of our backlight unit for the LCD display, which helps generate light and homogenizes the light output from these LEDs using this light guide plate. This light is then going to go through our bottom polarizing element and the thin film transistor layer, which will help switch on or off the individual liquid crystal pixels that give us the individual red, green, or blue subpixels. Next, we pass through the individual color filter that helps reduce the white light that's coming out from the light guide plate into the individual red, green, or blue channels that we want each pixel to have. And finally, a top polarizing element that gives us the ability for the liquid crystal to actually switch on or off each individual subpixel. Once the light has been generated in the LCD panel, we then go into our lens module. Starting off with the panel facing lens, we pass through a half mirror on the back side of this lens or on the closest surface close to our LCD panel. Next, the light is then rotated in polarization using a quarter wave plate that sits on this surface of the panel facing lens and then passes through another quarter wave plate on our user facing lens. That quarter wave plate will rotate our polarization such that we have now completely changed the polarization state and it will be fully reflected by the reflective polarizer underneath our quarter wave plate, allowing us to bounce back as much of the light as possible through the optical path again, passing again through the quarter wave plate here and here, to ultimately reflect back from our half mirror here, and finally bounce back up through the entire stack, rotating polarization 90 degrees one more time so that we can now pass through the reflective polarizer and go through the lens element closest to the user's eye, delivering the image that we are accustomed to see magnified from this original size on the LCD panel. That wraps up the teardown of the MetaQuest 3 and the really impressive and very cost-efficient pancake optics that we have in this device. Again, thanks for watching, and if there's anything else you want to see torn down, leave me a comment below. Thanks.